Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second Atomic Mass Transmissions Live of the day. That's right, if you missed it at 10 a.m. Pacific, Simone and myself unboxed our very first fresh off the printer uh, box of Shatterpoint, the core set, and we also shut off the Hello There expansion pack, which features Obi-Wan and his 212 homies. Uh, today, for the stream, I figured we showed the contents in their unassembled form. I might as well show some Shatterpoint terrain today. So we're going to do some Shatterpoint terrain painting. Should be pretty fun. I've got the airbrush all set up, so we're going to try to just knock through this uh, and have a good little time. And, of course, every technique that I'm going to show here, you can pretty much use on any terrain that you'd like to paint. If you don't have an airbrush, that's okay. We're going to be using the airbrush today just for speed and efficiency. But you just grab yourself a big makeup brush. We've done a few different streams. I know Dallas has painted a couple things terrain-wise on stream with the big brush method. I've done a couple of vehicles and other big things. So you absolutely don't need an airbrush to be able to make this work. Today we're just going to use the airbrush because I've got it, and I figured it'd be nice to do. So I don't plan on getting through all of this, but I did want to show off a nice selection of everything that comes uh, in with Shatterpoint as far as the train goes. One of the really cool things about the way it's designed is, of course, you can create all of your own little like setups and determine how you want the terrain to go. So you have all these different choices when it comes to how the gantries connect into everything else. And then, of course, one of the great things with the train is the fact that it is scaled for use with Shatterpoint as well as Legion. So here's a Legion Boba Fett, and he can just go across those gantries, get up here, act all cool. So it's a really great cross Star Wars set that can be used um, all over the place. I noticed that that's not, there we go. Ooh, look at that. He's way up there. He's all the way, all the way. Um, so yeah, so it's not just terrain for uh, Shatterpoint games. You can obviously also use it for Legion. We spent a lot of time making sure that like doorways and everything else was kind of scaled appropriately, that it makes sense for both games. All right, so. With that in place, and then of course, you know, here is our little Shatterpoint example. One Gar Saxon painted by the fabulous Dallas Kemp. So you get some really amazing shots. Your little Mandalorians up top taking shots down low. All this stuff. Boba next to a doorway. Sure. Let's see. Let's see if you can see that. There's the doorway. There's a Boba. All right, so with that all out of the way, let's go ahead and start knocking some colors on this. So I'm just gonna go for like a pretty classic, like Star Wars brown kind of uh, look and color. So I'm gonna be starting with some um, Archive X Earth color. And this is just gonna serve as kind of like the foundation for my um, whole palette. Grab this brush here, mix everything up. Summer's moving the cameras. We're off to a good start. Okay, that's flowing really nice. So we're just going to go in and lay out kind of a nice color. I'm not going to worry about this being too solid um, because if I have some nice like differences in values and You'll see that even with the Zenith kind of prime that I did on this, I didn't worry about like keeping everything perfect. So we have some little splotches there and everything. That's just gonna give life to the overall piece. So one of the nice things about terrain is that the bigger, the bigger it gets, the more you can kind of play with your, uh, with your base coats and your color saturation. You can make things like darker and have kind of those different nice values and changes in tones and highlights. I'm kind of like not being super careful, so I've got some mess over here. This will probably be metal, so that's fine. You know, I could mask all this off if I wanted to, but for this initial coat, it's really not a big deal. I think we're just going to have this little piece also be brown. And then I've run out of paint because my cup's really small and I've got a lot of area to work, so just plow in more of that. Mix in more. Mix it up. Let's see. Um, so you get the towers in the core set. You get this building in the core set. You get a bunch of gantries. You get two towers, I think. 
This building, I believe, also comes in the core set, I think. Um, there are some different pieces that come in the different, um, in the take cover terrain box. Um, there's obviously the rock formations, if you've seen that. Um, and there's like the speeder bike that's kind of hanging out and being cool. So there are, there are pieces in the terrain boxes that you don't get in the core set. But for the most part, you get a very good amount of terrain in the core set. If you combine it with a friend's core set, you'll have more than enough to play a very robust game of Shatterpoint with lots of different high-rises and gantries and everything. One of the things I love about how the setups can work is obviously if you want to have really high elevation, you can use your towers to make upper deck levels. Um, and we've seen some really fun like Lego combination style things where you can take all these different pieces and glue them together in different ways to really create your own unique buildings and kind of building block your way to your own table setup. And then obviously it's um, important that you kind of attach everything the way you want it to make sure it's all nice and sturdy and set to go. Um, this out. Let's see, I still got some brown left in here, so even though I don't plan on doing all of this terrain, I will go ahead. Oh, got top piece here. Crossbar down here. Okay, so I'm going to put that piece to the side and I will do this building until I run out of paint. <sighs> Does the train have stat cards? No, there's no stat cards for terrain. Um, there is a recommendation of like, you know, number of terrain pieces that you should use for a robust table. Nice, we're out, perfect. All right, so we kind of got started on that one, but I'll worry about that one later. So let's move on to our next color here. So I'm gonna take my base color I'm gonna take a little of this Oroco. Yep. Which has kind of got this nice brown to it. I just wanna mix a little bit of my base in there. I'll take a little bit of my thinner slash airbrush cleaner, which is just water and a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Mix it all up. Check my spray really quick. We'll grab this back. Should be close enough to dry here. Now, lighter touch, because I'm not doing my bases. I'm just going to come in, kind of look at the edges and where my spot highlights would be. And I'll start highlighting up my spots. Now, one of the things that's really fun about terrain, especially for the Shatterpoint kind of style, which obviously digs more into that animated kind of like feel and flavors that you can be pretty stylistic when it comes to how you apply your colors and how your shadows. So we're just really looking for exciting, like high contrast, something that's just going to stand out really nice. And I'm not particularly trying to be like very realistic with how my highlights and my shadows are going. Um, so just really looking for that texture. And again, if you watched a couple of Dallas's streams, like he did a bunker once where he didn't use the airbrush. Instead, he used um, a nice big makeup brush. And you can just like stab. You can do exactly what I'm doing here with stippling by using um, a larger brush, either a makeup brush or a specific stippling brush if you have one, that kind of stuff. So... Um, so you do have a lot of creative flexibility and you can be kind of less precise when you're working on big stuff like this. It's a great way to kind of work on your airbrushing, control and skills. And if we go a little too far, we can always use glazes and washes and everything else to kind of like pull things back. Maybe we don't get the color exactly where we want it. We can kind of fix that up. All 
Let's see what else we got. Uh, this is a uh, Patriot 105. So, um, just a standard, just a standard kind of like workhorse brush. And a Wada Eclipse would work just as well. Obviously, if you have something like fancier, like a um, or finer, like a Sotar or anything like that, one of the um, a Wada HP, like HPB or HPC, like they'll all do kind of the same stuff. So you've got a lot of you've got a lot of freedom and flexibility on what you want to do here. But especially for like, let's need to get in there a bit better. Um, but especially for like painting big blocky terrain, something like the ba like the Patriot or the Eclipse is going to work beautifully for you. And this is like the same airbrush that we use for all of our um, same style of airbrush we use for like all of our Zenith priming that you see us do on streams. And oh, that got really messy. That's okay, I'll fix it. Shh. Got a little too heavy on the trigger. That's my fault. But totally fixable. All right, pretty happy with this. So let's go ahead and move on to our next color. Uh, I mean, as far as like getting into airbrushing and stuff, the biggest tip that I can kind of give is just give yourself the room to practice. Don't go whole hog right away. There's tons of great resources and videos out there. Um, I think the thing that I learned pretty quickly on was like, I thought the airbrush was going to be this magical like hack that was just going to unlock my speed at painting and it was going to make everything easy and super simple. And that is 100% not the case. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's gonna, it's going to be just like learning how to paint with a brush. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be times where you just, it doesn't work the way you want. Um, there's a whole new set of skills you have to learn when it comes to like, oh, why would you do that? Classy paint all over my finger. Um, there's just going to be, you know, there's going to be tricks and you're not going to be able to just start at a high level. Um, so being okay with the journey and kind of figuring out, you know, how to thin the paints properly, how to control the brush, how to prevent clogs, how to deal with clogs when they happen. There are all these great resources out there. So just, you know, give yourself the time and the patience to practice it and know that it's a skill um, and it's a tool in the toolbox, but it is by no means a magical, like, fix-all solution. And it will work for certain things better and other things not, and it really just depends on, like, what you want out of it. So obviously, you know, it has places where it's really strong and can be really, really useful. Kind of like I'm painting these bigger pieces of terrain and stuff, and it's very forgiving as well when you do it this way. Um, learning how to paint like a small trooper mini, it's going to take time, it's going to take practice, it's going to take trial and error. So you just have to decide like where you want to utilize it and then learning when and where to use it so that it makes your painting experience the best it can be and the most fun it can be. Um, it's kind of like that second, that second really important part to everything. So yeah, I, I think the big thing is, is that, you know, if you think it's something that you'll use and you're interested in trying out, you can get into like your first airbrush pretty easily now, fairly inexpensively. You know, don't go out and buy the pro top end, super expensive stuff first. Like start with something more basic and simple, build up those skills. And if it turns out to be something that you love and something you want to use more, then you can go, you know, hog wild and pick up all the really expensive, fancy stuff. Um, or you'll just get so good with the, you know, kind of the workhorse brushes, like what we're using here, that you won't need to really feel... Like, you've got to dive in and make a huge difference. So, all right. So, I'm going to use this lighter color. This is actually Thar Brown that I'm using here. And I'm just going to use it to really pump up kind of my highlights. 
and build up that texturing and go from there. Uh, Shatterpoint's described as a hobby game. What does that mean? So effectively, it just means that unlike a board game or a card game, um, you have a bit more um, activity and opportunity to make the game more of your own. So you're going to get to assemble the miniatures. You get to paint the miniatures. You can paint them canonically so that they represent, you know, replicas of what you see on the screen or in other media. You can go crazy like in a coloring book and create your own looks and colors. Um, and then, of course, you play on a three-dimensional tabletop that's filled with terrain and boards and all this other cool stuff. Oh, I need some more paint. Um, so that's what the hobby aspect is. It's, it's more than just a game that you open up, pull out of a box and play. It's, you know, like any other kind of hobby, like fishing or... Uh, lacrosse or golf or what have you, crocheting, knitting, all that stuff. Um, it's an all-encompassing kind of experience that has a lot of different facets to it, and you're able to kind of like identify what facets of it you enjoy the most. I think I've got a little bit of a stuck tip here. There we go. Um, and you can kind of build out from there. So there are people who, you know, their favorite part of the hobby and the thing that they do the most is assembling and painting miniatures and doing beautiful miniatures art. There are people who, you know, their favorite part of the hobby is actually playing the game itself with their miniatures and learning the strategies and developing skills and the ability to kind of, like, maximize their tactics on the tabletop. You're so sticky. All right, we got to fix this clog. Yeah. All right. Um, so all those things are kind of like the opportunity that's there and that you can do. All right, so we just had a little bit of dry tip going on, it looks like. So should be back in business here in a second. So this is like one of those moments live on camera that we talk about where the airbrush just does different things and can be used in different ways but it absolutely also has its downside so we've got a little bit of a tip clog here so I'm just going to clean that out and then we'll pull that back together and then we're going to take off the back and so this is the troubleshooting that happens so the big thing here is that apparently that got unscrewed and that probably made a huge difference okay so, there we go. So sometimes when you get clogged, the way that you can clear it is you just unscrew the needle and you just pull the needle back and forth and spray at the same time. And that'll kind of push out anything that's clogging it. And nine times out of 10, that'll do the trick. And that's why you often will see, um, just from an expediency point of view for me, I don't normally, um, I don't normally have the back on my airbrush because it's just quicker. I've been told and learned from experience that, you know, clogs will happen and it's quicker to deal with it this way. There we go. Back in business. All right. So we've solved our little clog that we had. Now we're going to get some nice good spray.
great. All right, so we're moving right along on our little brown building. So the next thing that I want to do here, let's do a really quick spray out of the airbrush. Get that paint off of our tip so we don't get any more dry tip. All right, and yeah, for those who are looking forward to Adepticon are gonna be there, obviously, first opportunity to do in-person life demos for Shatterpoint is gonna be at that Adepticon. It's gonna be great. Before Adepticon happens, of course, we're gonna have a whole series of different articles and stuff covering all of the gameplay aspects and core mechanics of Shatterpoint. So, there's lots of good stuff coming your way. The unboxing was just kind of a special surprise event that we decided to do because we had it, we were excited, and we figured why not. Let's show everybody just how chock full of good stuff the core box is, whet some appetites, excite some emotions, get people excited to see what's coming next for all these games and articles. Right, I'm going to use a little mix of white sands, a tiny bit of this Lilith yellow, mix this together into the cup. Let's see. And the demos will be happening all Adapticon, so. Even if you're not the very first in line, I feel like you know, you're not gonna have any problems having an opportunity to get your hands on the game and give it a try. We'll be there the whole time. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So you can see how using that airbrush, we're getting this nice little like textured effect. We're building up kind of our highlights and our areas. And because this is a nice big chunky building and I kind of want it to have more texture, I'm not super worried about making my blends like really tight and smooth. I'm kind of allowing the airbrush to do a little bit of that work for me. Similar to how I would do a stipple with a basic old brush. I think that's one of the reasons why doing these bigger pieces of terrain are especially great when you're learning the airbrush because it's a lot more freeing on your trigger control. So when you make a mistake and you pull the trigger too far back or your paint mix is kind of off, none of that really matters too much because you can either go back with a little bit of an ink wash or a glaze and pull that color back down really going to hit these upper edges now. So I'm just going to look for like places where I really want that sharp highlight. And I just kind of go in. Hit it really quick. Yeah. 
happy with this. Just gonna hit this center piece a little bit more. A little bit more contrast. Okay. And just one more pass here. So the other big thing that it took me a while to kind of figure out with the airbrush is that you know you don't do everything in one layer. So you want to hit the same area with the same color several times to build up the color gradually and to really let that airbrush transition effect work. So if you go a little too heavy like I just did there, not a huge deal on this. We'll fix it. But like here's a spot where I kind of went a little too heavy because I pulled the trigger back a little too far. So I want to fix that with my upcoming wash. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, so the color that I'm using right now is I took white sands and a drop of Lilith yellow and I mixed them together to create kind of that final highlight color. And then before that, we started with Archive X's Earth, which is just kind of a light brown. Uh, moved on to Oroko, went to some Thar brown. So we're just kind of having fun with the colors here. Um, now the last thing that I'm going to do, after I clear out this color here, so I want this to mostly be out of the brush as I move on to the next step. Okay. Is I'm just going to go right to some nice pure white sands, and so this is going to be pretty strong. So I'm going to be careful with it, but it should give us a nice little dash of like high reflective highlight. And then we can go back in with our, hopefully a brown ink or a chestnut ink wash that we'll find. And we can do some shading. Thar Brown, T-H-A-R, Thar, Thar. Um, it's from the Scale 75 range. In fact, the only paint that I'm using that's not from scale right now is the Archive X Earth. Okay, so. just looking at this straight white to be pretty sparing. So this is kind of like where we want the highest contrast or we want to really Pick out some edges, kind of run in along some of the hard lines where I imagine the light would catch a lot.
Brilliant. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna swap out my white, and we're gonna go back in, we're gonna do some shading, and I'm gonna do that with some brown ink, hopefully. Provided I can find some, because I didn't pull any. That was my mistake. I should have, I didn't. For shame. Um, but honestly, like at this point, you could just leave, you could just leave the building as is. Um, you wouldn't even have to go back and add any shading. It would look great. We could finish up the metals, um, do any other kind of like weathering or anything like that we wanted to. And uh, we would have ourselves a really great looking Star Wars style kind of outer rim building. Um, and of course, with the airbrush, you have so many other opportunities as well to do some like really interesting and unique things. And granted, again, you can do all of this stuff with a brush, but um, you know, if you wanted to do more of like a Pantora um, kind of inner cityscape, you could do the buildings more metallic or like all metallic and then use the airbrush to go in and add, you know, magenta and cyan tones to give that kind of like city nightlife neon glow feel to it. Keep the buildings themselves really dark. Um, you can of course go with any other color for building that you wanted to. So instead of kind of doing the traditional outer rim, um, yellow, brown, ochre kind of colors, you could go with green, you could go with red, you could go with black. So really you get to kind of design your Star Wars Battlefield for Shatterpoint or Legion, if you decide to use the train for that. Your Star Wars Battlefield in general. Kind of really just get to design it and create whatever world you want. I think uh, it would be really awesome to do the interior of a spaceship um, or a starfighter, like a star cruiser with all the gantries and stuff. And that could be amazing and look really good. Do, 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 do. Do do. That's metal. There we go. Ink tents. Ink tents. Chestnut. How beautiful. Can I show all the? Oh, you sure? Uh, let's see if we can get it all on camera. I guess. So this is all the stuff that I built for today, which is most everything that you're gonna see um, out of the starter. Um, you get obviously way more pieces of gantry and you get a bunch of ladders and some crates and stuff that aren't shown, but it's kind of like a good selection of the different Shatterpoint terrains. And then of course, you know, again, how you can design and connect all your gantries together to create some really cool um, battlefield setups and everything gets to go. Let's go back to this, take our chestnut ink. So there's a, there's a brown ink um, that scale makes, but they also have a chestnut. I think the chestnut will actually work a little bit better because it's got a, a bit more red to it. So it's gonna come out a lot nicer. All right. One of the wonderful things about working with inks is you don't really have to thin them. They come straight out of the bottle, like ready to go. And the big thing here is I just want to turn down my PSI on the airbrush. Because inks are so thin, great. Okay, so we're just gonna go in and we're gonna do some, um, some nice shading, so. That's a little thicker than I wanted, but watch this, we can fix it. Let's get a bit of this. Maybe just like use our brush and mesh it in there, kind of like how we want. So now what I've learned is that I need to turn down the airbrush a bit more, and that's okay, we can do that. And I'll just get a little dab it, because we want this to be kind of like shade anyway so now we're just more like antiquing which was not my original intent but will work fine okay there we go 
All right, so I'm gonna turn down just a bit more. Ooh, too much. Now we're at zero. Well, let's try there. Yeah, that's, that's about right. Okay. So again. So now you can see this is what we wanted. So we just kind of hit wherever we think we want a little shadowing in. So really, really light touch. Maybe this part's gonna be a little bit more shaded. So if we want this in here a bit darker. And you just kind of let that spray really work for you. And you'll notice that I'm using a really light touch. Um, a shade wood, you'd want to use like a really controlled wash is what you would do here. Or you could antique it because it's such a big spot. So what I mean by antiquing is kind of like when I made that mistake and the airbrush was too high on the PSI. Um, you, can do a, you can do a heavy wash and then take a paper towel and basically go in and dab it all off. And um, by doing that, you'll create a nice little textured effect like we have here because the wash will obviously only stick in the deepest shadows. The most raised sections of the mini will wipe all of it off. And you won't, the thing with like doing just the wash itself is, um, whoop, hold on one second, is that it stains the whole area. And we obviously don't want, we don't want the whole area to be stained. We want just kind of the, the recesses and other things to be darker. Um, so that's where like the antiquing on something that's this large works really well because you can kind of go back in and save yourself the trouble. Okay, I don't know what come in here. We'll kind of darken this up. And this is really like dealer's choice. So personal preference, how, how much shade you want in there, how far do you want to go. Um, you may do this with a combination of airbrush and brush because there are just some areas that are going to be really difficult to get to. Um, Maybe those areas there. We want to use a brush instead, or maybe we'll just use the brush to kind of like meet everything back out, make it so it works. So if you keep your tools kind of handy and just work with whatever you got, there's a lot of things that you can do when it comes to this stage to get the effects that you want. And of course, because it's a natural exterior, you get a lot of freedom in terms of like, things shouldn't be uniform and perfect. You know, this thing's been, this building's been out in the elements. It's probably seen a sandstorm or two. So even when I go a little bit too heavy there, it's still fixable. It's still gonna work perfectly nice. But I can always go in and kind of like affect those areas with the brush if I need to. And I've got a little bit of a dry tip, so pull that out. Um, the buildings are hollow underneath. So you can obviously mount them on a base plate if you wanted to. You can just leave them as is. There's a lot of different things that you can do. So I'll have to 
obviously this area here is very much in the recesses and in shade, so. I wanna make sure that I get a lot of my shadows in there. I'm like, remember we missed, we missed these with our base, but I said it wasn't a big deal because I can just come back through because those are pretty far in shadow. We can just use our little wash here. We can push them here, here. So we're just going to push our contrasty nature a bit. And maybe we like that, maybe we don't. Maybe we just wipe it with our finger. We do a little less right here. Do a little more. Maybe we come back over here. And maybe we want this area to be like really in shadow because we imagine the sun doesn't come that way. So again, this is all just really thinking about like, where do you want those shadows placed? And mostly you're gonna think about like where's the light gonna fall? Do I need to darken up? So under the eave is obviously a big one. Maybe right there, but we went a little too heavy. That's okay. Just kind of like come back through and Muss it all up. Tip really quick. All right, so let's see. Hit lower down here. Get that over here. Maybe we'll darken this part up a little bit. Yeah. Just kind of dinge this up. Largely keep these upper edges a bit brighter. Maybe we even deepen those up even more. So one of the cool things about the ink, of course, is that it's translucent, so there's a transparency going on. So all of these different like volumes that we built out with the airbrush are still gonna show through even though we're just gonna color them more brown or dingy. So we're not losing any of the work we did, and that's kind of like the strength of doing it in this order with the airbrush until you run out of ink. Is that you get to use all of that highlighting work that you did. There we go. Um, so you get to use all that highlighting work you did to make everything go. How big a part of game does terrain play? I mean, like many or nearly every miniatures game, tabletop battle miniatures game, terrain has a very big impact on, you know, strategy and tactics and um, how can you get to an objective? How do you keep your opponent from getting the objective? What are the different um, options and opportunities you have? So it, oh, look at that. We just get a big old sploosh. Just gonna use my finger. So terrain has a, has a huge impact in terms of your tactics and your strategy. And obviously 
Um, there are trooper abilities and other things in the game that can be affected greatly by how your board is set up, how your battlefield is orientated, all that stuff. For example, obviously, if there's not a whole lot of... Oh, look at you go. Now you're coming out. That's all right. Hmm. Let's turn you down again. Um, so obviously, you know, Gar Saxon, clearly. The Mandalorians, a lot of them have jump packs and their ability to utilize... Oh, I turned it down too much. We're at zero. No! Um, their ability to use those jump packs to traverse terrain and elevation and heights and all of that gives them a strategic and tactical advantage over, say, the clones who... <gasps> Man, I just can't get this right. Summer, I blame you! It's clearly your fault. I know, isn't it? This is, you know. So remember when I said the airbrush isn't necessarily faster or easier? Here it is. You're you're living you're living why. There's a lot. There can be a lot of um, trial and error when it comes to like getting your flow, and maybe there's a clog, and who knows what else is going on there. we're going to get there. I believe in us. And again, all of this really um, there. Ugh, isn't a huge deal because I can always go back and fix it. All right. Let's go back to this back. Do a little bit more. Here, just a bit more. All right. All right. So overall, Sweet. Pretty happy with that. Metallics today. Oh, I don't know. We got eight minutes, so we'll do what we can here. Um, now, obviously, you could do your metallics with the airbrush, but because I don't have anything to mask with, I think we'll just move to using a brush for those. But let me quickly just clear out this airbrush so that I don't have a super nasty clog to deal with later. So we'll just run some cleaner through it really quick. And then we'll slap some metal on there and see if we can get... We'll see how far we can get in the last eight minutes that we have. All right. mostly cleaned out. I'll finish that later. So for our metallics, we'll just start with 
thrash metal. We'll need a lot of it, so that's all right. And then we'll grab a little abyssal blue, I think. Oh, intense black, perfect. So I just want to darken this up a bit. And we can just go in and start slopping that paint on really fast and quick. And so this is an area like metals, especially if you're doing true metallics, like this is the place where you're gonna do plenty of washes and stuff. So you're just gonna dinge those up um, using like black wash, brown washes, purples, greens, whatever colors strike your fancy. Um, if you want it to be shinier and like nicer, you can do it that way. You'll notice the terrain that's like on the core box and stuff and it's in all the pictures has a semi-metallic. So that is basically a metallic like silver that's been mixed with some blue grays to take down its luminosity um, and create more of a uh, non-metallic, true metallic metal. So it's a bit of a mix of both. So it still utilizes the true metallics with that silver, but the shine and the sheen is taken down. Through everything else. And again, if you have, if I had some like masking and some extra time to do that, I could easily go in and do all these areas with the airbrush as well. Um, but the big thing is just making sure that you don't get too much slop over on the sides because you don't really want that. I've already made one mistake, but I can fix that. Later. We've only got eight minutes, so we're just gonna like rock through on our time. I'm not gonna worry too much about picking out those edges because why would I? So I'm going to go back and do later. So again, you just lay down your base. I mean, it's like painting true metallic metals on anything else. So lay down your basic metallics, um, whether with the brush or the airbrush. And then go back through and do your wash. Dingy it up, darken it up, give it all that nice little effect. And then you might do a second wash, depending on how dark and grimy you want it to be. Um, once you're done with your shading, just go back through and kind of pick out the edges and some nicks and highlights with some brighter metallics and steel. And you're basically done. So you can obviously do colored metallics as well if you want to make it look a bit more fantastical or from a different galaxy. I always like doing like blue metallics or purple metallics. Again, if you want to go like more inner, like urban city, downtown, seedy, Coruscant. Pantorum kind of style stuff. Um, you can use really dark metallics and then go in with either a wash or the airbrush and spray in like magentas and stuff to give it some shine. So there's a lot. There's a lot of things you can do, and really, um, it's all the same techniques, just on a bigger scale, that you would do on any of your miniatures. So any kind of crazy metallic or non-metallic or whatever technique you've used on your miniatures, if you like that technique and you're really comfortable with it, you can do the same thing here. Colored in. And once your base structure is done, let's say we want to go through and we want to add a bunch more weathering. So we've we've shown several um, different techniques for that over the course of the transmissions through like weathering vehicles and other stuff. So grab yourself a sponge. 
get in there and do some sponge stippling with different colors to indicate chips and weatherings. You can use heavier ink washes to create stains and like oil slicks and grime puddles and all of that good stuff. So there's a ton of fun possibilities when it comes to like breathing life into your terrain or not. Like maybe it's a, maybe it's a relatively like, you know, bougie Star Wars outpost and it's either new or the community has an HOA and they, they keep it up really well because there's fines and you can't park your speeder bike on the public streets overnight. So everybody's metals and house paints are really nice and shiny and there is no dinge. You know, it seems like it would fit with a Naboo or maybe an Alderaan. Those places feel like they have a lot of HOAs, a lot of rules when it comes to how your house needs to look. Got to keep that galactic resale up, you know. So, one minute. Well, we won't get to our washes and stuff, but you can at least kind of see how it will start to come together with the metallics. But for instance, once you've done this part, maybe you do want to go back in and let's just say take some We'll just do ink tense black because it's what I have available right now. Oh, wait. Yeah. Take some ink tense cyan. Drop it into the airbrush. Turn up that power really quick. There we go. Maybe we just go in and spritz in some color. Once we're done with that, we can go with some black. And darken it up really nice. What's going on with our needle if we're not shooting straight? and grimy and then we can go back over them again and so there's a lot of things that you can do with that airbrush to give a lot of texture and like anything like that going on and then either we do just a spray of metallic over top and build up our layers again we can keep going darker and darker all that good stuff. So. There's a ton of opportunities and different ways to handle things as you go through and do all of this, but for the most part, I think we did great on getting our base color for the building all ready to go. We have a little bit of cleanup over here where we got a little sloppy, 
And we've got our metal started to start doing some really interesting, like weird space metal metallic kind of stuff. So with that, yes, if you let off the paint before the air, you get less clogs on the tips. That's a great, that's a great um, tip and a way to, uh, and a practice. So there's a lot of good videos out there about trigger control and how to do that and everything else. Um, obviously moving as fast as I was through different things with one airbrush can also lead to a lot of clogs as well. So many, many ways to improve and I have by far so much more to go on the airbrush just like I do with my regular brush. So as always, it's a journey. Hopefully this was interesting for you and you're excited as we are about Shatterpoint and everything that's to come. Uh, the train is just so much fun. There's so many possibilities. I can't wait to see all the tables that people build out there with it. And of course, it's nice to paint something that's a little bit bigger than a Trooper Mini from time to time and get to try out some different techniques and some different opportunities on that. So be sure to tune back in tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific. Our own Dallas Kemp is gonna be painting Beta Ray Bill for Marvel Crisis Protocol. And of course, stay tuned to all of our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest and greatest news from Atomic Mass Games. Till next time, I'll see you next week. Goodbye.